Welcome back to Making Money Matter, ladies and gentlemen. This is part two of my conversation with Graham Home. He is the founder of the Infinity Group Australia. He is the original Money Mentor. His book's called The Money Mentor. He does a lot of events every Tuesday where he talks about uh, property in Australia and he talks about mortgages and how you can pay your mortgage off, not in 30 years, but in less than 10 years, because a lot of us don't understand the way the finance world works. Well, this guy's got a brain that works in completely different ways than any of us do. I love his events. I'll put the link down below if you want to come along to one of his events in the future, but a heck of a lot of information. But here on Making Money Matter, I am all about education. As I always say to you guys out there, stop watching Netflix, start getting educated. Welcome back, Graham. Part two. Thank thank you, Kerry, for having me. Pleasure. Uh, I want to go into the deep dive about uh, what Infinity are doing to change lives and what, I guess, to start off with, what your events are all about and why you feel it's so important to try and get, well, not try, we don't use the word try, to have people to better understand financial literacy. Yeah, Kerry, we, look, we're in a really blessed, fortunate position. We we don't take inquiries. We don't, you know, clients message, ring, we, we don't take inquiries at all. Like we're too big now. And yeah. I think that people, you know, there's plenty of businesses out there desperate for customers because they're trying to sell a product or sell a service. Now, from our perspective, we identify that that's wrong. And I know, and many people know our industry is, is uh, the behaviors in our industry are driven by incorrect remuneration, meaning when you go to a broker or a banker, the only reason they want to help you is to receive a commission. Yeah. And there's no advice in that for, I guess, someone like me who studied financial planning, studied some accounting, you know, studied mortgages, real estate licenses, because I've studied three or four things and gone and got tickets in them and studied them my brain can jump and cross pollinate. Now I don't actively practice all of them, but I don't believe brokers should the writing a loan for an investment property should be writing an investment property loan unless they've studied property or actually have at least owned, bought and sold an investment property or two. Right. I think you can classify brokers to mum and dad, PAYG employed broker, and I can refinance you and rip you off for another 30 years because Let's face it, if you've got a 30-year loan and you're five years into it and you refinance again, you're not saving money. You now have a 35-year loan because you started again. People go, oh, no, I took the same term. Grow up. You did not, right? You've all been taught to keep the lowest minimum repayment with the lowest interest rate for the longest period of time. That's not saving money. That's paying interest for a longer period of time. So my thing, Kerry, is financial literacy. Um, we're in a very fortunate financial position, a large scale organization that we could stop at any day. And that allows us to focus on giving value to the market. And by giving value to the market, people become educated. They can then make informed, intellectual, empowered, mathematical financial decisions for their family. Now, also banks should be doing this. They're not. But when consumers are educated, they can decide how they want to transact. They can make these empowered, informed decisions. So for us, we still take clients, but we're a professional services firm, hence all the awards behind me here. And by educating people first, and they do one, two, three different sessions, they they learn an abundance of information that they can actually go and take actionable, immediate steps to call banks and renegotiate interest rates and save thousands, to call banks and change the features of their loan, to overpay the loan without penalty and reduce the bank's ability to calculate interest every day on the debt. And you know, when you give people actionable, quantifiable guidance of a generic sense that they can implement, people become empowered. Absolutely. And you can take someone's money off them, Kerry. They can get divorced. They can get sick, their health, but you can't take a human's knowledge. Knowledge is power, but it's only powerful if you execute it. So for us, we just realized that the banks, the government, nobody wants people to be educated. Why? And that's what I was about to ask you. Why is it that in, you know, because I've been out there, I've been looking at looking around at various people and what they do and how they do it. From what I can see, you're you and in the Infinity Group are the only ones that seem like you're uncovering the mystique of the property finance 
business and the fact that a lot of people are getting oh, there's a lot there's a lot of people out there people out there carrying they're presenting free webinars and they're presenting free information and it's just a lead funnel it's a sales funnel yeah and yes after people have done our events they too can pay for our guidance but we don't sell them anything they pay for education with a leading independent economist a financial planner a chartered accountant an asset finance expert a credit lawyer so what we're doing is educating people. We actually don't need or want them to engage with us ongoing. We only select a, a small select amount of people each month that apply to work with us that yep. absolutely are driven to change their life. And we're blessed. Like I said, we're so fortunate to be in that position where other people are desperately that, <laughs> that commission breath. They're so desperate for the transaction. And the best way I can describe this, Kerry, talking to a health practitioner recently, could you imagine... If the pharmaceutical industry decided to come out and educate people on health and wellness at scale for free, what would happen, Kerry, to the We'd all start getting healthy. <laughs> and then would there be a, an abundantly profitable pharmaceutical industry any longer? Mm -mm -mm. Okay, now let's go back. If the banking sector came out all of a sudden and provided an abundance of free education and knowledge and concepts and strategies to save interest charges. Would the banking sector be so profitable? Absolutely not. Ding, ding, ding. So why are they trying to shut you down? Well, they probably are. I've had plenty <laughs> of run-ins with them where a bank says, we don't want to work with you anymore. And that lasts a year or two. Then they come running back and say, hey, can we work with you again? We want to work with you. I'll just go to another bank. I'll go get the money from somewhere else for my customers. So at the end of the day, the, the, wanker bankers are all the same. You know, the money's coming from the same place, Kerry, whether it's bank A, B or C or D, it all comes down from the top and filters into all these different lenders, but it's all only coming from a few places. So realistically, you can go from here to here. It's indifferent. But the, the, the core thing is that you've got a home, you've got a loan, you think you know everything. And you yep. don't, you know what marketing departments have told you or Dolomites to death because Commonwealth Bank used to do school banking. So you're stuck with ConBank until death do your part. Yeah. The bank, the banks call it share of wallet. If they can get you to have four plus products, savings account, credit card, insurance, car loan, home loan, you'll never leave. Too wow. much paperwork. Wow. So their target is, oh, by the way, Kerry, High interest at call online savings account for free. Now they've got your transactional banking. Now they've got your savings account. Then you get a credit card because there's points and you can get a magical toaster. Like the more products they can give you, the more likelihood you will never leave because it's too complicated. And then we pretend we're human beings. Aussies don't like feeling silly, Kerry. We get embarrassed. So we lie to ourselves and our friends and family, but I've got this great product and I've got this. If it was great, you wouldn't pay it off over 30 years and you wouldn't refinance it every four or five years like you all do. So what the, what should they be doing? Renegotiate. Renegotiate your rate every three to six months. It's one simple phone call. I share it on my social media every day. People come on my Instagram. Thank you so much. I save this. Uh, renegotiate every three to six months. You need to understand that interest is calculated daily. Mm -hmm. So if you can have a loan that allows you to store all your savings, all your children's savings, every dollar you earn, money in the bicky tin, in the money box, every cent you earn should be sitting in a loan that has free unlimited redraw. You should not be trusting offset. ANZ Bank, Kerry, didn't link offset accounts and overcharge fees associated with their products from the mid-1990s till about 2020 or 21. It was 680,000. Yes, it was 680,000 customers and around $200 million they stole from families due to a system glitch that they then admitted, admitted when ASIC sued them to pay a $25 million slap on the wrist fine for taking $200 million for over 20 years in fees, not linking offsets, and they admitted that their systems, processes, and procedures we're not capable of calculating the benefits associated with the offset account included, but not limiting to when people deposited money on a weekend or late at night, they weren't even calculating as if it was paid in some cases. 
But that's so, as as there is. So have they changed their ways? No, nah, come on. They've all been Westpac, Theftpac had a 32, 23 year system glitch, Conbanks, the, all of the institutions. I put a post up on this on social media. Hundreds of comments on my Instagram carrier people going, This happened to me at Bendigo. This happened to me. At They're real people sharing real things that have occurred. There's a gentleman in the weekend in my class said, Hey, I just did a loan with ANZ, had an offset account, got on internet banking, seen it was unlinked, linked it myself, took a screenshot. Three weeks later, I logged on and they'd unlinked it. Wow, that's just insane. I so, mean, yeah, I mean, you really can't trust big organizations to do these things. Okay, so what is the difference for those out there between offset and redraw? You just mentioned mm. both. Look, it's it is genuinely really too hard to explain in the time we have today. But an offset account is not audited. It is an account that if you had a hundred thousand dollars in your home debt and a hundred thousand cash in the offset, you should pay zero interest at all. And that's typically what happens. The problem is, Kerry, the banks may happen to run these algorithms, possibly that they seem to see where people that have a hundred grand home loan and a 283,176 and four offset accounts all linked and they're living in and out of them, which by the way, if you're spending out of an offset, you're not offsetting shit. The money's not there. Right. And if you understand human beings are impulsive and they spend what they have direct access to, that's why they created offset accounts. Okay, if you go back to the 80s and 90s, Kerry, there were actually loan products that my grandparents or people where you could put all of your loan like everything you earn into a loan. It was called an all-in-one. Ah. It was banking and lending all together, called smart pay back in the day, if you remember. And most pensioners now that didn't have superannuation, you notice they all own their home in their 50s. Yep. So very interesting that they bought in their 30s, 35s, 40s, all owned in their 50s, but had no retirement investments, so now they own their home. Isn't that funny that a lot of our grandparents paid off their homes in the 80s and 90s but have no retirement, so they're on the old age pension. Yeah. Which shows you that if you don't have the bullshit belief that there's someone going to look after you later or super or whatever, and you did it tough, they all paid their loans off in 15, 20 years because what they did was put every cent they earned in the loan in one. and they only kept a cash envelope for groceries, bills, and fuel. Now, today, since we got these stupid fucking things, everybody seems to think, I see, I want, I get, I deserve, yeah. I work so hard. You don't deserve shit. We all work big weeks. We all have problems in life. What your family deserves is for you to sit down, make a budget, pay every cent you can off your debt, and in 7, 10, or 12, or 15 years be debt-free and not have to pay your minimum payment for another 15 or 20 years. That is what you and your family deserve not to contribute to $32.5 billion in bank shareholder profits. It's disgusting. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, look, without uh, no names, no pack drill, um, there are people out there that will say, well, why don't you have a an account for holidays, an account for your bills, and another account for this? And why don't you take out a couple of credit cards? In fact, take three credit cards out, and then you can rotate them. What do you say to people like that, Mr. That Hope? they're a fucking idiot? <laughs> I mean, let's be... Interest is calculated daily. Okay. So if you have a home loan at 6.5% and you put $100,000 into that home loan, you will save, which is the same as earning, $6,500 a year. And Kerry, you will pay zero tax on that saving because interest earned versus interest saved are different. That's how an economy works. So interest saved is always going to be higher than interest earned, i.e. the cash rate in a savings account. You might earn 4% in a savings account. Yep. You then get taxed on that as interest income yes. as opposed to earning, so 4.5 less tax or put it in the loan and you will have 6.5% untaxed sitting in the loan redraw. But again, people don't understand this. That Now some people go, oh, well, I should go invest and earn 12% per annum. Yeah, well, that's like you must know the Monopoly guy. Like you can go and do that if you're a sophisticated investor, but if you never sell, you never make a profit. Ah. If you go invest your money and you go make 8% per annum carry and you're really smart and go, well, that pays my 6.5% for free. No, it doesn't. Because if you don't sell at the end of the year, you did not pay the 6.5% with the profit. 
and the 8% gross profit, less broker fees, advisor fees, capital gains tax, sale, right? You're going to be earning less than six and a half. So when you actually model this with a good accounting firm or yourself and look at what money you need to make in investing, less tax, less commissions, et cetera, for a net profit above six and a half percent, a lot of people would realize they're not investors, they're losers. Wow. And that's what they don't understand. And one of the other things that you always talk about is, as you say, interest calculated daily, put everything, every penny that you have against that home loan and you can pay it off that much quicker. And pe the other thing people go, oh, but inflation and my property is yeah. going to double in 20, 30 years. Sure. But do you want to own your house and have an interest only debt and have effectively paid rent the whole time and think you're really smart? Or do you want and still have a debt of half a million and it's doubled? Or do you want to own your home, have no debt because you were smart with your money and also the property's doubled in value because you'd be twice as wealthy as the people that don't? Mm. What it, what, why is it? Is it because they get taught in school and it's marketing that they don't understand this? Because I know that you're passionate, uh, Graham, about getting people to wake up and understand. It's nothing, it. no, Kate, it's nothing to do with school. This is all personal belief. Okay. Australian, all, all, wherever we come from, Aussies are arrogant. We are so arrogant that we are correct. You know how I know? Just get on social media on anyone's post. Mother Teresa could be on social media and people could tell her she's a bad human being. Yeah? Yeah. Like everybody has an opinion. So they're like backsides. Just sit on them. And everybody's different. And this person says that you've got to pay tax. And this person says don't pay. Let's be very clear. If you're a business owner tuning in and you don't pay tax, you're broke. That just means you Wait, followed yeah. society and said, I earned two hundred thousand dollars in revenue this year, and my accountant let me spend two hundred thousand dollars. Good point. So I earned it. So I spent it, and I don't pay any tax. Well, that's dumb. You'll be broke forever. You got no super. You got no savings. I would rather pay forty, fifty thousand dollars tax, go to a bank, borrow money, buy some gold, some silver, buy some funds, buy some real estate with borrowed money that's tax deductible, free money that I don't pay tax on, I get tax back, I would rather pay tax and then be able to borrow and leverage to invest because guess what? The average home in Australia is going to go up way more than 40, 50 grand in the tax I pay that year. Gold, funds. So people are wired. Australians, we're all wired, carry to do dumb shit. That's yep. what keeps us going around and we all tell each other the dumb shit we do to make us sound smart and feel good. And then our mates copy the dumb shit we do to sound smart and feel good. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy of stupidity. And people get upset when I talk like this, but I don't need a suit and tie. I've got no one to impress. I've got enough friends and family. I can count on one hand. I've got thousands of infinity family members that would, would walk over fire for me because I've changed their family's lives yep. because what I do is contrarian. There's no bullshit. There's no fluff. What I teach is mathematically correct. And I'm, I always welcome people to challenge me, get on Zooms with me. I actually had someone that messaged me last week about this from another podcast I did, started commenting and said, oh, I'm not going to argue with you publicly on social media. I'll DM you. And then I got a DM saying, I'd rather get on a voice call. So you know what I did? I actually called that person live on speaker and I was filming episode two with those boys for the podcast and ah. put them on speaker. I went, hey, how you going? I went, who's this one? It's Graham. And they went, oh, oh, oh you so I didn't. I said, well, I'm calling. You didn't want to have an argument with me. So I'm happy to have a conversation with you. How can I help, man? <laughs> this guy went to absolute fucking water, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't published it. I've got it on camera. Oh, well, I said, <laughs> You don't have any context. It's a 60-minute reel on social media. 60 seconds is all you can post. Sorry, blame Instagram. Why don't you go listen to the 90-minute podcast? Yeah. Yeah. When you do, message me again over the weekend, and I'll call you again on Monday. What is it now? Tuesday, Wednesday? No call. Wow. Now, I now I do not, for my hourly rate, Kerry, or family time or limited time, seven days, I do not have time or any benefit to call that gentleman. But you know why I did? I know that I broke his thought pattern, changed his psychology, okay. completely re-educated that man, and he will now live in a better position in abundance, but he's embarrassed that he spoke to me the way he did. 
And he knows I went out of my way to help him. I love that. That's a beautiful story because that's what you do a lot of. You just go, I'm just, I'm here to help people. But it's a cuddle with a struggle. I'm not here to cuddle anyone. Yeah. I don't, cuddle people don't like me as it is, but a bit of friction, a bit of sandpaper. You want the truth? You yeah. can't handle the truth. No, you, you've got to give people the truth. Well, let's let's handle the truth in a different way. A lot of people turning around. I mean, I've got a friend that uh, still hasn't bought any property because it's going to crash one day very, very soon. I think well, it hasn't crashed good. more than 5.5% based on average capital city medians in the last 36 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, 55 recently. And then it grew 18% in the subsequent two years. Right. So given that you've got to have 20% deposit typically in Australia, Kerry, you've got to have taxable income as well as a 3% per annum buffer. So if you borrow at 6%, six and a half right now, the bank audits your statements to see that you have discretionary spending at 9 or 9.5% .9 per annum. On the average loan, Kerry, you have to show you've got an extra $400 a week or about $19,000, $20,000 a year, extra money when you get your loan approved. That's why when rates went from 2 3% to 6 Kerry, no one lost their home. We they actually didn't, had no. the lowest defaults in history. There was no mortgage cliff. Dr. Andrew Wilson and I talked about it for weeks on my YouTube. All right? So these people that are trying to time the market, congratulations, you've lost 30 40% in the last few years. You're a fucking idiot. Sorry, friends or not, Kerry. I, I, I met a gentleman with Lou, my GM, recently. He's been timing the market in the eastern suburbs or northern beaches of Sydney for 14 years. Do you think you might have mistimed it, buddy? <laughs> hmm. When a million dollar property is now worth 1.3 or 1.4, from him, you know, five, six hundred thousand dollar property is now worth two million dollars. I think you might have mistimed it, mate. Well done. Why houses you... have never, ever, ever, ever carry houses have never historically become cheaper. Now, let's look at the stock market or gold. It's never, yeah. ever, ever become cheaper. Over a hundred years, they pretty much all do the same thing, but property has the power of leverage. Right. Stocks, et cetera, do not. Yeah. So if you want to go and get, if you've got a hundred thousand dollars today, Kerry, you can get a hundred thousand dollars of stock. If it grows, I'm making a number up here. If it grows at 10%, your hundred thousand dollars is worth 110. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take the hundred thousand dollars and a bank would give you a loan of 90%, you can buy a million dollar property. That million dollars grew at the same 10%. You, your hundred thousand dollars invested into a million dollar property now went from a million dollar property to a one million one hundred thousand. You got a hundred percent cash on cash return if you sold. Now, leverage allows that. So, over shorter periods of time, you're getting rental income tax deductions. You can get 10 percent on a million dollars, not 10 percent on a hundred thousand dollars. And that's why, for me, I love the power of leverage compound interest. I love that. I love that the property doesn't bobble like stock, so to speak. And I get excited when it corrects. If it drops 5%, I'm pumped because I reckon it'll grow 10 or 20 in the next year or two. Wow. Happy days. Okay. And and I'm happy. I'll send you the graph from Dr. Andrew Wilson that shows exactly that for the last 40 years. Maybe you can pop it in your show notes or something. Yep. Yep, but after idea. every slight 4 or 5% correction, we grow 10, 15, 20% in the subsequent two or three years. So is there any loss at all? No. So for all these idiots and self-proclaimed gurus out there waiting for the market to crash, you should do this. You should do that. You should keep your opinion under your backside and sit on it. Because, hey, sure, show me your... $10 million portfolio of funds and ETFs or show Kerry your vault full of gold that you've got, <laughs> you know, like keep it gold and keep it real. But yeah. yet Kerry, these people, like I reply to them, Hey, yeah. What's the size of your portfolio? Question mark. No response. Next day question. They disappear really quick. Now, by the way, you can't win an argument with an idiot. So they come back with some rhetoric or dribble or nonsensical shit based on nothing and they're not accredited, licensed, and they won't. What do I do at an event? I get on RP data and show people 20, 30, 40 properties I bought, sold, and owned. You can't argue with the truth. But you can't argue with an idiot because it's like you've never had a swimming lesson, you've got no floaties, and they'll pull you down to the deep end of the pool and let you drown. <laughs> you cannot argue with stupidity, hun. You cannot. 
uh, you, you you talk about that um, and not stupidity, but a lot of a lot of people out there actually don't know. Like they're happy to own their own home, but some sometimes people say, "I can't get ahead. I can't do anything." One of the things that you've often said is, "Most Australians will have a buy and hold strategy," and you say, Mm-mm. "Am I well, right?" Buy, buy and hold isn't a strategy. It's been around since time commenced, Honestly. right? It's dumb luck. Like buy and hold, like. It's a, you never sell. Like, you don't make any money until you sell. Yeah. Oh, but I've got to pay capital gains tax. Well, one day when it's worth more, you're going to pay more tax because it's increased more. And you can get this thing called the 50% CGT discount, or if it's your own home, you can sell it free of any CGT if it's your home. People genuinely don't understand shit, Kerry. That's the this crazy thing. And they act or inact on what they have convinced themselves is true that they heard. You've seen in my courses, people try to take what I teach, one and one equals two, and they go, but it could be four if you do this. No, one and one is two. Unless you double it, then it's four. So the problem is we make up these beliefs and we feel smart because that's how our brain processes the information. And then we get comfortable with it and then we sit with it and then we never change anything because we're fearful. Fear is one of the big uh, things that holds people back. And uh, I, I think one of the things that you've often said in, in your calls and your courses is that a lot of people will own their own home and then they're going to go and buy another place and get that one as an investment property. And you say, that's why most Aussies only ever have one investment property. Yeah, this is one of the ones why? that's had over a million hits on socials, Kerry, when I explain this. Your home has no capital gains tax. Investment properties should be leveraged. It's just a simple fact. Power of leverage, tax deductible debt. If you have a home and you've got a lot of equity in it and you want to buy, only when you want to buy a new home, you want to buy a new home, you don't need to borrow a million dollars when you can sell your old home and get six or 700 cash, right? So, on me. It's really critical that people, from a serviceability perspective, The reason all Australians get stuck is because they have heaps of equity in their home. They make it an investment, which it's not. It's a home, by the way. It was never bought strategically as an investment. They then go and buy a new home and they keep the old one. Go, but I get a few hundred dollars a week rent. It pays the loan. But you're paying $60,000, $70,000 a year interest that you don't need to pay on a new home that's not deductible when you've got all the money over here, right? Now, separate of that, if you did move all the money and sell the old home and buy and sell in the same market, oh, it goes up in value. But you buy and sell in the same market, there's no capital gains tax. You now save sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year in interest. Guess what you do? Draw all the equity you've got in that property, that new home, and buy three to four investment properties. And you know this yourself because yep. I've modeled for you. Kerry, if you keep these this portfolio, you can only borrow X amount of money. Kerry, if you sell that and clear this debt, you can now borrow 10, 15, 20 investment properties. So I think it's critical that I'm purely talking, and you know this from personal experience, I do. that I'm not making it up. If anybody out there listening argues this and they actually had a credit license and they did a borrowing capacity on keeping an old asset and buying a new one and trying to pretend it's an investment versus actually moving the money, right, and having less bad debt and then drawing new debt. This is a home and home. People don't get, oh, but if it was an investment, leverage it up. Debt. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about, okay? Do a serviceability calculator, and if you do that, you will not get more than a second and third property approved unless you have income to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's simple, okay? There is zero debate. I laugh at the comments on social media. I've been doing this for 23 years. I might start posting serviceability calculators and tagging the people in some reels for a giggle. But again, 60 60 second reel to get people's attention versus 90 minute or 30 minute podcast or YouTube. Everyone's an expert. And I, and I, and I have to say, you know, and, and in full disclosure here, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I was one of those buy and hold people and, uh, Graham and and I have worked very closely together, and I'm not going to disclose exactly what I've got, but um, what what Graham has done is he has completely changed my portfolio. But I had to get over that 
we call it the Schwingterpacke, the fear. Fear and trust are the two things which will hold you back from doing anything. So my, this is not an advice channel. Go make sure you do your own research. You know, mm. talk to your financial advisor. This is Graham and I having a bit of a chat. But jump onto his Zoom call. And the reason I want you to do that is unlike Graham, I am passionate about making sure that people are fully aware, fully educated, and actually stop making the banks all the money and start making some for themselves. Mm -hmm. Last uh, comment goes to you, Graham, as we wrap this up. And I'm going to get you back on because this has been a lot of fun. What, <laughs> you, what What's the best advice? Give us give us two things that you think people should be doing right now before as we wrap this up. Budget and budget. Ah. <laughs> now, budget doesn't mean eight minutes, six different way or two minute noodles, seven different ways. You would not pull out of the driveway tomorrow and drive to work, Kerry, without a route or a plan. Mm -hmm. A budget is a nasty, dirty word. The people that are broke that live in scarcity and spend everything they earn. A budget is a financial strategy or a financial route saying, I need this much for fuel. I need this much for food. I need this much for fun. This yep. much to go out with friends and family or the cafe on the weekend. It's not restrictive. To actually live in abundance, you need to create a strategy of how much you need each week to live comfortably so you can afford to live in abundance when desired. So what I would say, Kerry, is budget and budget and not restrict yourself, but create a financial strategy that allows you to not leak in those leaky buckets, to mm. not overspend. I've never met somebody, Kerry, that I don't find $50, $100, $300 a week of shit ever in their statement. Oh, that's not me. Bullshit. Open your internet banking on your phone. You've watched me do it live on stage, Kerry, for years. I find thousands of dollars a year and the people very quietly just disappear back to the corner <laughs> of the room. It's so true. It's so true. You can't. So, you know, and Kerry, so the other one, the budget, budget, I say budget and be honest with yourself. If yeah. you're sitting here and you're listening and you're like, oh, I'm doing so well, guess what? Print your statements off your internet banking or bring them up on your phone and write down every dollar you've spent for the last 30 days, seven days. 14 yeah. days, do two weeks. Yeah. And then you will go, oh shit, Graham was right. The first step is being honest with yourself. Once you're honest with yourself, then you can build a new strategy. And that will absolutely change everything if you start sticking to it. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it has been an absolute pleasure, Graham, always to have a chat with you. I know that you've got another Zoom call uh, tonight. It's a, it's a Tuesday. We'll pop this out tomorrow, Wednesday. Uh, if you want to get on to Graham's great mind and what he's got and he doesn't mince words he will tell it like it is he'll call you on your on your mistakes and as he rightly said just then budget know where your money's going it's your money you take care of it and start to invest rather than watching netflix graham home great to see you keep up thank the you Kerry. Work. absolute pleasure cheers